Thank you for joining us for our next study in the book of Revelation. We come to the last few verses of the third chapter, John's seventh letter to the seventh church in Asia Minor. Today it is known as Western Turkey. This is the church of Laodicea. Has anybody ever said to you, you make me sick on my stomach? If those words have ever been spoken to you, it it was not spoken as a compliment. You either said something or did something or there was something about your person that just was repulsive to the other person and they didn't even want to be around you. If that ever happened, I hope it was temporary and not permanent and they got over it. I wonder what it would be like if I asked the Lord, what do you think about Goodview Baptist Church? Just give me your honest thoughts, Lord. And he would look at me and say, Well, you know, when I think about Goodview Baptist Church, it makes me want to throw up. That would give you pause, and it would stop you in your tracks. And you begin wondering, What is it about our church that makes Jesus want to throw up? Not the best term to even think about. Listen to this verse in chapter 14. Uh, chapter 3, verse 14. Write this letter to the angel of the church at Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. In each of these letters, at the beginning of the letter, Christ gives some description of himself. Most of those are found back in chapter 1 where we see a picture of the glorified Christ. This description of Christ is not found in chapter 1, but it's used to relate to the church of Laodicea what Jesus Christ was like. He said, I am the Amen. Now many of you probably are familiar with the term Amen. Maybe you've heard it said in churches. You may know that it means so be it. I guess it's one of my pet peeves in church that if you say, you know, we need to go out and share Christ with everybody, and people say, Amen, so be it. And that's, that's true. We believe in that. But sometimes I hear pastors say or preachers say, you know, people are dying and going to hell. And then the people in the congregation say, amen, like, so be it, let it be true. I'm thinking that's not a place for an amen, that's a place for an oh me. So Jesus presents himself as the true and faithful witness. The amen, you can take it to the bank. What I'm getting ready to say about your church is undisputable. It's the way it is. It's spoken from God himself. He is the beginning of God's creation. Now there are some religious groups that use this verse as a proof text that Jesus Christ was created. He is the beginning of God's new creation. But the word beginning there in the Greek is the idea of the originator. Christ is the originator. He is the creator of God's creation. He's the source of it. And so as he writes to this church at Laodicea, he said, I'm the the source of all creation. I'm the one that is true. I'm the one that is faithful. You can say amen to that. So what I'm getting ready to tell you, you can take to the bank. And then in verses 15 and 16 of Revelation chapter 3, we read these words. I know the things you do. And we can almost stop there for a moment. God knows what you do. As we saw in a couple studies ago, the church of Sardis had had a reputation for being alive, but were dead. God knows what you're like. He not only sees what you do in public, but he sees what you do in private. Someone said what you are in private is what you really are. When nobody's watching you, what you watch on television, what you watch on the internet, how you treat your family, how you treat your wife, what you think about, things that you say, that's what you're really like. And Jesus knows what we're really like. If we are spending time in the Word and we are committed to obedience, He sees that as well. The church may not realize everything that we do or the ways that we are, but God knows the good, bad, and ugly about us. And He says to the church at Laodicea, I know all the things that you do. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
And there's the idea of making God sick on his stomach, of making him want to throw up. Lord, what do you think about the church at Laodicea? Well, it, it turns my stomach because they're, they're lukewarm. Now, the city of Laodicea was, was up on a plateau, and that's where the church was located, where the people lived. Down below them was the city of Colossae. And Colossae had fresh water, it was cool water, and maybe some of you have been out on a hot day and you've worked to the point almost of exhaustion, and you think, if I could just drink some cold water, and it's refreshing to you, just it, it peps you up and it gives you more energy, just getting that refreshing water. Now, north of Laodicea was Harpop uh, Harpopolis. And this area, this city, had hot springs. And people would go there to be soothed. I, I love taking a hot bath. I probably take 15 ba hot baths to every one shower I take. I just love sitting and soaking in water and just letting it minister to my body and soothe me. And so in the city north of Laodicea were these hot springs that was refreshing. And down below it in the other city was cool water that was refreshing. Both of them ministered to people's souls and people's spirits. I used to hear pastors say when I was growing up, you know, God wants you to be hot or cold, on fire for Him or just not on fire for Him at all. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm. And I would hear that and they would make their case why it was okay not to live for God and be cold. And I would always think, where in the Bible does it say that? Where does God say it's okay not to live for me? I wish you were not living for me or living for me, but don't straddle the fence. That's not what I believe Christ was saying to this church. I think he was saying be cool and refreshing or be hot and soothing. <coughs> but don't be lukewarm. There was an aqueduct system that would go from Colossae up to Laodicea. And it was a couple mile journey from the waters below to the, where the city was located. And when the water got there, it was tepid. It was, it was lukewarm. It was that which was not refreshing in any manner. Maybe you've been to a park I have growing up and through the years, and some of these parks will have water fountains outside. And you step on a pedal and the water begins to come out. And I would encourage you, if you do that, not to get the first particles of water that comes from that water fountain. Usually it's a little bit dirty. Usually it's a little bit hot if it's out in the summer in the, in the hot weather. You need to wait for a little while. Let it run a little while. The, the, the warm water or the hot water becomes warm, and then it becomes lukewarm, and then it becomes cool, and then it becomes cold. And after a minute or so, it can be refreshing water. But you don't want it when it first comes out of the water fountain. And Jesus said that's what the church is like, not, not the water system, though that was the analogy. Your life is, is sort of indifferent. I mean, you're not, you're not soothing and you're not refreshing. You're just, you're just existing and you're not committed to me whatsoever. You know, I, I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were cool and refreshing to people's lives and hearts and, and energize them. Or I wish you were soothing and ministering to those that are hurting, but you're neither. Verse 17 of chapter 3. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I love this picture of a little cat looking into a mirror and he sees himself as a lion. And sometimes we see ourselves as a whole lot more than we are. And the problem is we're self-deceived. This church, they thought they were rich. They thought they didn't need anything. They had everything they needed. Maybe it was a large, growing church. And sometimes we evaluate churches by how many people attend there. If it's a growing church and new people are coming, God's really working there. If you look at the bank statements and they've got enough in their bank account to exist even if they had some bad months for, for a year or two and they've got a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in the bank, they say, wow, that church is, is being blessed of the Lord. This church said we're rich. One of the manufacturing products from this city was, was black wool. It was used to make clothing, it was used to make rugs and carpet and, 
and, and they were getting rich off the sale of this product. There was also a banking industry there, and they made a lot of money through the banking industry because they had a lot of money to loan out and to, to, to reap the benefits from that. And then there was also a medical school there that was known for its ISAF, and it was sent around the world. So these three uh, products produced a lot of riches for this city. And because the city had a lot, they really didn't feel like they needed to depend upon God. They probably wouldn't say that if you ask them. But in reality, as a practical matter, they were trusting in themselves. And I think it's harder sometimes to walk close with the Lord when things are prospering in our life than when things are falling apart. I think most of us, when we go through a crisis situation and we come into a circumstance that we just don't know how to deal with and it's going to crush us, we cry out to God for help. It's in those valley experiences that we realize our weaknesses and we ask for God's strength and God's help. But when things are going well, sometimes we don't trust God and depend upon God and cry out to God like we do in the difficult times. And this church was, was self-reliant. They had not come to the place where they were dependent upon God's power and God's presence and God's working in their life. They thought they could do it themselves. There was an occasion where this city was de demolished, I think by an earthquake, and the Roman government decided they would help fund the city so they could rebuild. And the people of the city said, we, we don't need your money. We've got enough money in our stockpile to rebuild ourselves. We don't need any outside help. It's sad when a, an individual or a church practically comes to the point where they're not really dependent upon God. They think that they're more than they are. They're, they're self-deceived. They, they think they're rich. They don't think they have need of everything, anything because everything seems to be going well. But that may be short-lived. God's chastening hand may be right around the corner. Look at his advice and counsel to this church. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You think you've got it all together. You think you can take care of all your needs by your own resources. But I'm telling you, you're in a bad shape. You're in a bad way. I'd like to read to you from Revelation chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Maybe some of you have invested in gold or silver through the years, and maybe your investment has done well. But Jesus is not saying to this church in Laodicea, give me your money and let me buy blocks of gold for you so maybe you can become rich. What he's saying is your lives need to be purified by the fire, by the blood of Christ, the way gold is purified, with all of the impurities taken out of it. That's what the church needed. These Laodiceans needed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They needed to live for Him. He goes on to say, Also buy white garments for me, so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness. Now, that's not saying that the people in this church didn't have clothes. They, they wore clothes. They were modest. But the idea was that they were naked before God. They needed to be clothed upon with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that we're made right in Him. We receive the righteousness of Christ. We're accepted by God when we trust Christ as our personal Savior. And then he says you not only need to buy gold from me and get garments from me, but get an ointment for your eyes so that you can see. We've heard the phrase, there is none so blind as those who will not see. You know, we can get hardened to the things of God. Sometimes you'll talk to people about the truths of Scripture, but their mind is already set differently. They're not going to listen. They're not going to reason. They're not going to be open-minded. They've, they've decided what they believe, and the Bible doesn't make any difference from, to them. That was true in the church in Laodicea. They, they were known for their eye salve and helping people to see, but spiritually they were blinded, and they needed to be open to the things of God. The verse finishes by saying, I correct and discipline everyone that I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference, from your lukewarmness, from that which turns my stomach. You're not living for me. You're dependent upon yourself. 
You think you can handle it all by your own resources. But I'm challenging you. I'm trying to correct you. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get you to turn to me. Daniel Henderson made this statement a few years ago. He writes a lot on prayer. He said, prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. If we're not praying, we're not really trusting God the way we should. The fact that we are calling out to God in prayer or conversation or help or praise or confession of sin or whatever your particular prayer may involve, it shows our need for God. There, there was one occasion mentioned in the scripture where Jesus prayed all night. If Jesus is God and he felt the need to pray all night, how much should we pray? When's the last time you prayed all night? When's the last time you prayed half the night? When's the last time you prayed a full hour or a half hour or 15 minutes? You know, we can become indifferent in our loyalty and allegiance and commitment to Christ. This church was dependent upon themselves. You know, we're doing okay. We got good numbers. We're meeting our budget. We got a good reputation. And Jesus says, you make me sick on my stomach. You're lukewarm. You need to turn from your indifference. Are you on fire for the Lord? Are you closer to the Lord now than you were before the pandemic started? Are you closer to the Lord now than you were five years ago? We should be. Every year we should be more and more like Jesus Christ and more committed to obedience in the way we live. And people should see it and know it in our lives. Verse 20 of chapter 3 is a very familiar passage of Scripture. And there's an artist rendering of this verse that many of you are very familiar with. The verse says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. Jesus in this verse and in this portrait is not seen inside the church, but outside the church, knocking to let them in. Someone looked at this painting years ago and said, there's not a doorknob on the door. How's he going to get in? Well, the verse says it. It's got to be open from the inside. God's not going to force his way into our life. He wants us willingly to invite him in to be a part of our life and to be involved in our ministry. Is he knocking at your door today? What does it mean to knock at your door? Not, not at your house door, but is he working on your heart? Is he drawing you closer to Him? Is He convicting you of ways that need to change? That's what He was trying to do with the church at Laodicea. He was trying to get their attention. He was trying to get back in. And He says, if you'll open the door, if you'll repent, if you'll turn from your indifference, if you'll be either warm or cold, if you'll be refreshing or soothing to people, I will come in and we'll have a meal together. Doesn't mean He's going to come down to our fellowship gathering and eat with us. It's talking about fellowship. He will, he will share with us. He'll commune with us. He'll be a part of our life. He's not going to make himself uh, present in our life. We have to invite him in. We have to willingly make that choice. Now, he's omnipresent. He's always there. But our closeness to him can change according to our commitment of our faith and of our obedience. And then the chapter closes and the letter to these seven churches closes with these words. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I am victorious and sat with my Father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To me, there's a ray of hope in that verse. There's a lot of things about your church that I don't like. As a matter of fact, there's nothing good that I see that I really like. But I'm giving you the invitation to let me come in and take control again. And if you'll open the door, if you'll open your heart, if you'll repent of your ways, if you'll come to obedience in me, I'll fellowship with you. And if you continue to walk in fellowship with me and live for me, then there's coming a day when you're going to sit victorious with me on my throne just like I do on my Father's throne. Now if you're listening today, not just hearing but listening, let the Spirit of God deal with your heart. Are there ways in your life in which you are indifferent? 
Let me give you some challenges as we close. Jesus would say to you and me, as he said to the church in Laodicea, I'm, I'm knocking. I want you to let me in. I want you to open the door. I want a fellowship with you. In, in what ways in your spiritual life are you self-deceived? Is your prayer life, is your service at church, is your victory over habits that are displeasing to the Lord, are they where they should be? I heard a pastor say recently in concerning prayer, he said, when God doesn't answer your prayers, does it surprise you? Most of us are not surprised. I'm not sure how much we really believe that God's going to work in accordance with our prayer anyway. We've had so many prayers that seem to go unanswered, it, it doesn't surprise us when He doesn't answer. And it's not that He doesn't want to answer. It may be that we're just indifferent and we're not where we need to be so His blessings don't flow in our life like He wants them to. There's a, a booklet that's been put in a PDF form that you can Google and read online. It's called My Heart, Christ Home. And in this booklet or in this paper, it talks about each part of our body and how that maybe one part is a library or one part is a living room or a bedroom and, and how that Christ wants control of our home, of our tabernacle, of our temple. And should we give him control? And how can we do that? And so if you get a chance, that would be a good resource for you to read. I think something for you to meditate on and think about in, the, in lines of Laodicea being an indifferent church. Don't be indifferent. I hope it will never be said of our church. And I hope it will never be said of me, of the Lord. You know, they make me want to throw up. May we wake up. May we open the door. And may we fellowship with the Lord the way he desires for us to, for our good and his glory.